We study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel. We've got extra copies. If you would like one to follow along, just raise your hand up real high. Someone will drop one by your row, your aisle. Anybody at all, make sure you've got the text to follow along. It's always helpful. We're going to be running between sort of the end of uh, John chapter 18 and on into John chapter 19. The setting and the narrative uh, and by the way, your Bible is uh, 66 books. It's kind of like a library, different kinds of literature. Narrative is a huge part of the Bible. Um, and so there, there are historical references to, that we can sort of triangulate and, and see that this is, this is actually history. This isn't just a fable or a myth. This is stuff that really happened. And uh, as we're presented here with John's gospel, it appears to be really clear that this person, John, is an eyewitness to much of, if not all, of what he writes about here. Uh, he's done some research. He's writing a couple of decades later, that's right, but oral tradition is so sound back then as a form of handing down history. And, uh, and he himself would have been one of the closest of Jesus' disciples, Peter, James, and John, three of the closest ones, the more intimate friends of Jesus. And so John has firsthand knowledge, eyewitness knowledge that he passes on to us. And he writes with the intent that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing in him, we might have life in his name. He's not just trying to sell books or movie tickets. He actually wants us to have life in the name of Jesus Christ and to find life in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we are at the place in the narrative where uh, Jesus has returned to the Jerusalem area. He intends to lay down his life on the cross, uh, not just to be another tragic martyr figure in, in human history. There are many of those. Uh, and, and he doesn't live his life out like he does just to be an example. There's none finer, but he isn't just, he, he didn't come just to be an example. Uh, he actually came to be a savior. And the good news is, that's what I need, and, and that's what you need as well. And so we're really glad he did that. Um, I think the burden of every religious belief system is at least twofold. One, to answer the question, who is God? Uh, and that entails also what is God like. At that, if you believe in a God, what, who is God and, and what is God like, okay? And then the second big category of questions is how can sinful human beings like us be reconciled to a holy and righteous God? How's that possible? Does this religious belief system in any way posit some kind of a solution to the problem of humanity, which I think is very clear and obvious to all of us if we just pause for a second. And guys like all the way back to G.K. Chesterton, you know, uh, wrote things like the, that original sin was the most provable doctrine of the Christian faith because you can see it in the street every day. I would add to that we can see it in the mirror every day. Uh, I can. And I think if we're all honest, we can. So what does the Christian faith suggest is the solution to the problem of humanity, which isn't just more money or more education, because you can be an educated fool, and you can be an uneducated fool. You can, it's not just money either. You can be poor or wealthy and still be wicked, be evil. Um, so here we look, and we're going to see on full display all of humanity in this little passage that we're going to study today. As Jesus comes to this, this period of time we call the Passion Week, and he has been before the religious leaders, uh, and in John's gospel, he focuses on the, the, the trial before the former high priest, but he's still sort of, he, you know, once you have that title, you sort of live with it just like ambassador or, or former presidents. We still call them that. So Annas, the former high priest, his son-in-law Caiaphas, now the technical or functioning high priest, and, and Jesus has gone before both of them, these religious leaders that are seeking to kill him, seeking to find a way to put him to death, and we'll see that revealed in this passage as they take him now before the, the Roman government official, a guy named Pilate, who most of you, I'm sure, have heard of, but... Uh, uh, Peter has just denied Christ three times. The, the rooster has crowed, and that, and that account is in all four Gospels. But here we have this focus on Jesus before Pilate. Look at verse 28 of chapter 18. Let me read. I'll make a few comments along the way, and we'll wrap it up with some summary. They led Jesus, therefore, from Caiaphas, remember, he's the functioning high priest, into the praetorium. That would be the, the house where Pilate would live, Pilate, the governor of the region. Typically, uh, his main residence is Caesarea by the sea. 
But when the festival is on and the feast is, the, the Jewish feasts are on, uh, uh, Jerusalem would swell from, from a few hundred thousand people to uh, well over a million people. And so he would come uh, to Jerusalem with a stronger uh, armada of, of forces to keep any riot from breaking out, okay? So he added the praetorium. That was a place where Pilate would live. It was early, and they themselves did not enter. These religious leaders didn't enter into the praetorium in order that they might not be defiled, but they might eat the Passover. So they're very concerned as religious guys about the forms of their faith, and we have a struggle with that as well, don't we? You know? I grew up in a, in a church where, you know, it, it was, it, you were more holy if you wore a tie. Today, I'm not very holy, as you can see. I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling with my holiness, uh, uh, as are many of you in this room as well. It's not really a mark. It's not really a mark of our, of our spiritual vitality or uh, to, to not wear a tie, nor is it a mark of your spiritual maturity to wear a tie. As a matter of fact, some of you are going to be shocked to hear this. Please, don't leave the church. But Jesus never wore a tie. I know some of you are shocked. It's just going to be tough for you. All over lunch, you're going to be arguing this thing. But uh, uh, it's true. These guys are so upset. They don't, they, what they're concerned about is that they not be defiled and couldn't eat the Passover meal, the Passover lamb. Meanwhile, they're plotting the death of the ultimate Passover lamb. Wow. There's some irony. That's what makes this narrative so exciting to me. It's you know, it, 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 it's just filled with this kind of thing where what's held before us is our tendency toward inconsistency, our hypocrisy that's actually held up because we, we say we believe X, Y, Z, and then yet we live another way, and that's not a new problem at all. It's as old as humanity since the fall. Pilate, therefore, verse 29, went out to them. This is Pilate, the governor. He's, uh, uh, he's the governor uh, of that area, the, the uh, southern portion of Israel, Judea, uh, from about uh, 26 to about 35 AD. Um, he's, he's, he's got some difficulty with his boss in Rome, the, you know, the emperor. Uh, some Jews have already gone to Rome and complained about him. He's very violent. He's very mean. Uh, but uh, we're going to find him to be sort of a combination of, um, uh, well, he, he, he's sort of curious a little bit, but not really, and then uh, um, he's fearful. He's afraid that, especially with his job sort of in a ten, sort of a tenuous place, uh, he's afraid that there might be a riot. And the, Jew, the Jewish religious leaders know this, and so they're going to they're going to play into that a little bit as they come before uh, him, bringing uh, Jesus. So, verse twenty nine, they went out. Uh, Pilate went out to them because they wouldn't come in his house. They, he went out to them and said, "What accusation do you bring against this man? What charges do you bring against this man?" They answered and said to Pilate, "If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you." Okay, and guess what? That's not an answer. You know, some of you ever do that, or do your kids ever do that when you ask them something and they give you a non-answer, or maybe your spouse gives you a non-answer, or one of your employees or you as an employee try to give a non-answer. You, you get asked a specific question, but you give a vague answer, hoping to dodge somehow. And that's exactly what's going on here. Pilate, is, he, he sees it. He goes, look, watch what he says. Pilate therefore said to them, well, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. Okay? Don't bother. In other words, don't waste my time if you don't have a specific accusation. Take him yourself. Judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said to him, verse 31 is so revealing, we, do not, we, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. Oh, thank you, John. You just peeled back the layers and told us what their real motives were. They didn't just want to bring an accusation against Jesus, and they didn't just want to say something vague about him. They wanted him dead. That's their motive. And, uh, and, and this is so clear. This is, the, you know, that we're, not, we're not permitted. And, and that's indeed the way it was. They weren't allowed. That capital punishment had been taken away from them. And uh, even though they used to do that, they used to, uh, the Jewish form of capital punishment was stoning generally. But now in this particular time, uh, the Roman government is, is you know, sort of the political context of the region. Even though the, the religious context is Jewish and the cultural context is Greek, the Roman government and Roman law is the political context. 
And verse 32, John reminds us that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. That is, Jesus had predicted that he would be lifted up in his death. Not that he would be stoned to death, but that he would be put up on a cross. For that to happen, the Romans would have to do it. For Jesus to predict that in advance just reminds us that he was in charge the whole time, even not only with the timing of his death, but the means of his execution and his death. Jesus completely in charge. Verse 33, Pilate therefore entered again back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, you are the king of the Jews, question mark. Now the, the, the you there is emphatic. And, and so it's as if he were to say this, you are the king of the Jews? You? You know? It's, it's, he's incredulous. He, does, he looks at him and he thinks, really? You're the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? I, I think I'm consistent in trying to say that every time Jesus asks a question, it's, it's rhetorical, that he actually knows the answer. He's the son of God. He actually knows everything. Uh, I think he wants Pilate to search through whether or not he's being manipulated by these religious leaders, to search through whether or not he believes that Jesus is who he, said, who he claimed to be. Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? He made, Jesus, Jesus was so good about making everything personal too. I don't know if you noticed that, but I, I, I feel like he always is pushing the conversation to the heart of the matter. And that's really good. It's annoying sometimes when your heart is dark like mine sometimes, but it, it's really good for us for him to shine the light uh, uh, in, into those places, those most you know, deep places of our hearts. Um, verse 35, Pilate answers him and says, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own, your, your own nation and the chief priest delivered you up to me. What have you done? He's looking for the accusation again. Jesus answered, and, and now he's going to talk, he's really going back to that first question about him being a king. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered up to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. And so Jesus is talking about the, the very essence of the kingdom of which he's the king, and that it's completely different from what Pilate might be thinking. Pilate's mind is given to politics. Like many of our minds in our own day and time are all about politics. Just turn on your TV and that's all you hear about. People are either angry or excited. People are either despairing or thrilled. And, and to the extent that every single time there's an election, we get gleeful and joyful, it just might reveal that we might care too much about that. Or to the extent that we get completely despairing, thinking the world's coming to an end. And now we're saying that politics is what determines the course of a sovereign God's creation. Or is he not sovereign somehow? Jesus says, I'm a king, but I'm a king of a different kind of kingdom, and it's not from this world system. Pilate answered and said, so you are a king. He really thinks he's got him. Now, you know, it's awesome. And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And then Pilate said to him, look at this. What is truth? Three questions that are probably a part of everybody's philosophy 101 course in modern day times. What is truth? Or maybe they voice it differently and say, is there such a thing as truth? It used to be our institutions of higher learning were in pursuit of the truth. But now our institutions of higher learning deny the existence of truth, for the most part, and like to dismantle anything that someone claims is true. And uh, many reasons for that. But it becomes a self-defeating thing for us in the world in which we live. And it's one of the reasons there's so much chaos and fear. It's because if you believe there's no such thing as absolute truth, you're making an absolute statement. Are you absolutely sure about that? That there's no such thing as absolute truth? Jesus had already made the claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't just claim to have the truth or point to the truth or know the truth. He said, I am the truth. 
And here, Pilate literally says to him, what is truth? And then immediately, look what happens right after that. What is truth? And immediately he walks out. He just, he just leaves. What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews, and, which, by the way, he's not going to find the truth there. He's not going to find the truth in their murderous minds because the, they're, they're predetermined to posit false testimony, to bear false witness. You know, the Ten Commandments say you can't bear false witness. Ten Commandments say you shouldn't commit murder. Thou shalt not do either one of those. They should know that. And here they are so worried about being defiled, not being able to eat the Passover lamb, but ready to lie and ready to murder. Just shows their hypocrisy and their inconsistency. He uh, goes back out to them. And for the first of three times at the end of verse 38, here's what he says to the Jews. I find no guilt in him. What did he just do? He just declared Jesus innocent. He'll do it three times. If you want to put a one of three in your Bible or even in the Pew Bible, that's fine. But one of three times that he will declare Jesus innocent. You have a custom, Pilate says to the Jews, that I should release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? Therefore, they cried out again, saying, not this man, meaning Jesus, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas, John tells us, was a robber. In other words, Barabbas, a convicted criminal. Jesus just pronounced innocent. Will be pronounced innocent two more times by Pilate. It's really fascinating. Barabbas, son of father. Ooh, interesting that Barabbas is sort of the opposite of Jesus, who's the son of God. Here's Bar Abbas. And he was a robber, a criminal, a terrorist, essentially, a political insurrectionist, exactly what they're accusing Jesus of, these religious leaders of his time. Now, um, this is the end of chapter 18, but please remember when John the Apostle is writing, uh, uh, he doesn't do chapter breaks. The chapter breaks were added somewhere. First time printed, I think, in our, in our uh, uh, Geneva Bible of, of, uh, in the 16th century. Chapter breaks and, and verse breaks. Chapter breaks maybe go back to the 13th century with Stephen Langton. But, but still, he keeps right on writing. He keeps right on telling the story. So look at verse 1 of chapter 19. Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Why? He just declared him innocent. Why would he do that? Certainly prophesied in the Old Testament that Messiah would undergo that kind of treatment. Scourged him doesn't just mean scolded him, doesn't mean just wrapped his, his knuckles with a ruler. But the whip would have had some bits of rock and some bits of metal or glass in them, and they would have laid it across his back and ripped it. And I don't mean to get overly graphic with it, but I'll just tell you, Jesus will become uh, unrecognizably bloody and, and, a, and a horrific mess. And this, an innocent Man, a man declared innocent by the man who's having him scourged. He did that because he loves me. He did that. Jesus allowed that to happen to him because he loves you. And he'll go to the cross for the exact same motivation. Um, that's one of the reasons we'll come to the table and say thank you today. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they arrayed him in a purple robe, and they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him blows in the face. And the man of sorrows, um, Jesus, the Savior of the world, Redeemer, uh, the Son of God, being abused like this under false charges, uh, sitting there taking it, when, yeah, he could have called 10,000 angels. Yeah, he could have. Uh, but his mission, his purposes will be fulfilled, even as it costs him his life. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you, that you may know that, and here's the second time, I find no guilt in him. And he brings Jesus, therefore, who came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, unrecognizable at this point because of the bloody mess that he is humiliated because his clothes have been rent open 
And Pilate, in the big dramatic move, says, Behold the man. You know, here's your king. Here's the one you, you, he, who claims to be your king. When therefore the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. Third time, Pilate says, No guilt. Jesus is innocent. Um, right there, verse 6. The Jews answered and said, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Well, that's blasphemy. That's a religious law. That's not a political law. It's not a civil law. Pilate doesn't care about that. He only cares about the political stuff. The Jews answered him and said this. They, 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 they said, we've got this law. Well, Pilate therefore heard this statement, verse 8. He was the more afraid. He entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, you do not speak to me. You do, do, do you not know that I've got the authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? In other words, your life is in my hands, buddy. Look at you, you're a bloody mess. I've got a th I, can, I can end your life right now. Jesus answered and said, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me up to you has the greater sin, speaking presumably about Judas at that particular time and or, and or the collection of religious leaders who delivered him up. But he again refers back to his own source origin as not this world, but from above. And that authority, all authority, is from above. A sovereign God hasn't misplaced anything in his creation. A sovereign God is aware of what's going on. And though it may look bizarre to us at times, he's still ultimately in charge. And that's the hope I have in this world. And that's the hope you have as well. As a result of this, he made efforts to release him, Jesus. But the Jews cried out and said, if you release this man, you're no friend of Caesar. That's Jews saying that. Jews saying to a Roman, you're no friend of Caesar. There's some irony. You're no friend of Caesar if you release him. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. They're trying to highlight um, the fact that Jesus was claiming to be a king so that they could stir up some fear that, uh, that perhaps it's a political insurrection that's, on, uh, that's about to happen. Um, when Pilate therefore heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, uh, in Hebrew called Gabbatha. Um, and in Matthew's record, you see the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have some different emphasis in the Passion Week. Um, Matthew, I think it is, that will tell us that, that Pilate washes his hands, attempting to say, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. And evidently, his wife had had a dream a couple nights ago saying, don't have anything to do with this guy, Jesus, you know? And Pilate didn't listen to his wife. Heads up, husbands. <laughs> and so he got kind of trapped up, caught up in this whole deal, right? And, uh, and, and, and here... Uh, he is, you know, in Matthew, they it tells us he's trying to wash his hands the whole thing. But no, it's, not, it's, not gonna, it's actually not going to happen. Verse 14. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. That'd be about noon. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. Again, trying to keep his drama going. Therefore, they therefore cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Do you understand what the chief priests are saying there? We have no king but Caesar? They're just, I mean, they're, they're literally trashing their own Ten Commandments now. No other gods before me. No other king, no other. Ult your ultimate authority is supposed to be God, Yahweh. And instead they're saying, we have no king except for Caesar. In other words, we, we profess, we declare our fealty to Caesar, basically. And so then he, Pilate, delivered Jesus up to them to be crucified, fade to black. We'll, we'll look at the rest of that story and the crucifixion uh, next week. But what do we learn here? Well, let me run just a couple of things by you. Um, I like to just uh, allow the text to speak. Sometimes we, sometimes we can identify with different persons in the text and learn something. The religious leaders remind us that being religious isn't always the same thing as being righteous. 
Just because you go through the motions and you're really careful about, oh, I gotta eat that Passover lamb, so I'm not gonna go in the Praetorium because the Praetorium is a Gentile house, and add to that, it's a Roman government Gentile house. I'm not going anywhere near that because then I won't be able to eat Passover, and it's all about the forms of their faith. Do we ever do that ourselves? Yeah, we do. You know, and some of us think that the building is somehow or another uh, incredibly holy in some way. It's really just a building. Um, it, it is the place we meet with God. That's wonderful. Place is important. Don't hear me. I, I, I'm not saying place isn't important, <clears throat> but it's not ultimate. Um, so we don't fight over the color of carpet in the, in the sanctuary anymore, do we? In churches. We don't, we don't fight over whether or not we're going to, you know, have, have a, well, we got, we got a B3 organ up here, okay? I, have, I don't think I know of a church that's argued over a B3 organ. I've heard a lot of ch churches argue about their pipe organ, but that's the Village Chapel way, I guess, to just have a B3 over here. But that's, that's one of those ones that, you know, has a Leslie speaker that swirls around and, you know, that's like, that's like not wearing a tie. I mean, that's what that is. But we're not going to fight about that because that's not, that's not what we worship, see? The object of our faith is the living God. And uh, especially as we, we look to Jesus, as John wants us to, to believe that he's the, the, the son of God, that he's the Messiah. Um, this is beautiful that he would present himself to us and reveal himself to us so that we could not simply forsake religion. We're not trying to do that. Tradition is good, but traditionalism isn't. Tradition is, is the living faith of dead people. Traditionalism is the dead faith of living people. Which do you have? Which do I have? Am I putting my faith in the forms of my faith, or am I putting my faith in the object of my faith, who should be Jesus Himself. Secondly, Pilate reminds us that you simply cannot sit on the fence regarding truth. Pilate asked what is truth and walked out. I guess Pilate didn't really want to hear the answer to that. 1992. Um, some of you remember the movie A Few Good Men. Who was alive for that? Anybody in the room at all? A few of you. I was at the other campus. I asked that question. Very few hands went up. <laughs> so... That famous scene, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson, their characters yelling at each other, you want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> I don't think Pilate could handle the truth here. And I don't, I don't I, you know, in the world in which we live right now, I'm not sure there are some people that can handle the truth. The reason is they don't want there to be truth. Why? Because it, it means you're all of a sudden accountable. And we worship in our day and time at the altar of autonomy. It, and it shows up in a million ways, even in the sort of soft selling of self-image. You can be anything you want to be. And hidden in that is this, you can be God. You can be your own arbiter of right and wrong. You can be anything you want to be. And I got news for you. That's a lie. I can tell you, how do I know this? I cannot be the next Super Bowl winning quarterback. This will never happen. And I think I can say the same thing about you. I, I, there was that old song, I believe I can fly. And everybody loves singing it, but none of them can fly. <laughs> Here's what I can do, drop. <laughs> Why? Gravity! And I thank God for gravity. Oh, man, we take it for granted all the time. What if God shut it off for 10 minutes? We take this for granted all the time. What if God shut off oxygen? What if God shut off water? What if God shut... There's so many things that we depend... We are dependent creatures, and yet we, we worship at the altar of autonomy. But you cannot avoid truth. You can't sit on the fence about it like like old pilot there. Stott said, there's only one authority under which mind is free, and that is the authority of truth. Mind is not free if it's believing lies. On the contrary, it's in bondage to fantasy and falsehood. It's free only when it's believing the truth. And this is so whether the truth in question is one of science 
gravity or whatever, or of Scripture. And this is God's truth to us. Thirdly, Barabbas reminds us that Jesus took our place in his death on the cross. Jesus was sentenced to be crucified on a Roman cross, a form of execution reserved for criminals, convicted criminals. Barabbas was a convicted robber. He was a political insurrectionist, actually guilty of what Jesus had been accused of, but Jesus was innocent. Here's the irony of this story. That's why it's an amazing story, too, because the irony is so great, and justice is so trampled here. You know, the injustice, the greatest injustice of entire, all of human history is that Jesus Christ had to die for my sins. It's also not only the greatest injustice, but it's also the greatest act of love, wisdom, and kindness that the the human history has ever seen because he took my place. He took Barabbas's place on the cross. He took your place that day. Fourthly, the Roman soldiers remind us that Jesus, the Savior with wounds, is the Savior to both the abused, and I'm even going to say this, and some of you may not like it, but he's also the Savior of the abuser. He was mocked, beaten, and whipped, and abused. And if you have suffered any kind of abuse, physical or uh, emotional, I grew up being abused verbally a lot, not by my mother, but by someone else. And um, that has its, you know, that, that placed its scars on me. You've, everyone in this room probably has some kind of story like that, and some of your stories are probably much more horrific than mine. Um, but I seek to persuade you that this God of the Bible, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, really knows, really knows, existentially knows what it means to be abused. And he came to be the savior of the abused, you, me, and of those who struck him that day and yelled at him and those who drove the nails and those, the one that put the spear in his side. And and to even put on offer the gift, the free gift of salvation to even the guy that declared him innocent three times and then let him go to the cross, handed him over. to He, He came to offer his life a ransom for mine and for yours. The crowds... Remind us that we have an opportunity to choose our king. I love the way N.T. Wright talks about this. We want a religious leader, not a king. We want someone to save our souls, not rule our world. Or if we want a king, someone to take charge of our world, what we want is someone to implement the policies we already embrace, just as Jesus' contemporaries did. But if Christians don't get Jesus right, what chance is there that other people will bother with him? Um, I know there are those that would say, what's wrong with the world today is religion. Um, And there are some problems with uh, our history, uh, all of us who are religious, no matter what religious background we may have. But I will say this, what's what's needed in the world is more proper, more right, more grace, more gospel-oriented religion. We need more of that And, and, and less of the kind of religion we see in these religious leaders who are willing to uh, sell their souls, literally, and, 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 and turn their backs on their own religion to say we have no king but Caesar, to, to have murder on their minds, to have fa- bearing false testimony as part of their practice. These guys have failed miserably. As we look back, we should learn the lessons of history. We should throw ourselves before the cross to receive not only God's forgiveness and his mercy, but also to be loved by him because he came to the cross to show us in in brilliant luminosity the love of God for sinners, for those who nailed him to the cross, for those who slapped him that day, and for me and for you as well. That's the kind of king I want. I don't know about you. Who do you want to be your savior? Do you want to depend on your religiosity, your following the rules? Or do you want Christ to be your savior? Who's your king? Is it Caesar somehow? Is it, is it some form of earthly solutions? Or do you look to Jesus? Do you look to his gospel as what will set things right ultimately? His plan for his creation and, and trust in his hope and hope in his promises 
that he's made, that this world is not all there is, that the way things are right now, yeah, they're broken, but he intends one day to set things right. And he's, been, he's given us a deposit on that uh, because the Holy Spirit has come to live within us, to convict us of sin, to convince us of what is true, and to conform us to the image of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Do you trust him as your king? I hope you do. Do you trust him as your Lord and your Savior? I hope you know him that way as well. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this passage. Use it in some way, the good seed of your word, that it might, that it might find fertile soil in our hearts, Holy Spirit, you might use it to bear fruit in our lives. Uh, Lord, that you would, you would help us to fix our, our faith and our minds and our hearts on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, in whose name we pray, amen and amen.